comments? I have a few jokes. Um, you know, it's amazing. These actually are... are Hi, Fran. These actually are from the um, actual bulletins that were put out in different churches, mistakes they made, and they're quite humorous. So let's hear what some of them said. Here's one. Bertha Belch, uh. a missionary from Africa, will be speaking tonight at Calvary Methodist. Come hear Bertha Belch, all the way from Africa. <laughs> How about this one? The sermon this morning is Jesus Walks on the Water. The sermon tonight, Searching for Jesus. <laughs> These are actually in the bulletins. How about this one? <laughs> Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Don't forget your husbands. <laughs> <laughs> the peacemaking meeting scheduled for today has been canceled due to a conflict. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Don't let, don't let worry kill you off. Let the church help. How about this one? Next Thursday, there will be tryouts for the choir. They need all the help they can get. How about this one? Barbara remains in the hospital and needs a blood, blood donors for more transfusions. She is also having trouble sleeping and requests tapes of past <laughs> Thanks, Walt. Pastor will preach the farewell message after which the choir will sing Break Forth into Joy. How about this one? A bean supper will be held on Tuesday evening in the church hall. Music will follow. At the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be What is Hell? Come early and listen to the choir practice. <laughs> Eight new choir robes are currently needed due to the ad addition of several new members and to the deterioration of some older ones. <laughs> Please place your donation in the envelope along with the deceased person you want remembered. <laughs> Attend and you will hear an excellent speaker and heave a healthy lunch. How about this one? Potluck supper Sunday at 5 o'clock. Prayer and medication to follow. <laughs> this one. The ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind. They may be seen in the basement on Friday afternoon. How about this one? La ladies, no, that's not uh, censor, censor. <clears throat> How about this one? Low self-esteem support group. We'll meet Thursday at 7 p.m. Please use the back door. The eighth graders will be presenting Shakespeare's Hamlet in the church basement Friday at 7 p.m. The congregation is invited to attend this tragedy. How about this one? Weight Watchers will meet at 7 p.m. at the First Presbyterian Church. Please use the large double doors at the side entrance. That was pretty bad, wasn't it? I'd like to see those papers that were handed out to those. So I often wonder when Joe puts ours together, we probably would find some of them there too. All right, open up your Bibles, please, to the book of Acts. And tonight we are on chapter 6, but we want to get our feet wet by the little introduction. But you can go ahead and turn it to 6. We'll be moving around a bit, but we'll be within the vicinity. How's that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word is truth. And Lord, truth plus the Holy Spirit means life and change. And we pray tonight, O oh God, that the Holy Spirit would take the word of truth and seal it in our hearts, O oh God, that we might be able to do the word and be not heroes only. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the book of Acts. Uh, the very first verse of the book of Acts says something like this something. It says this, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Notice the word began. Um, Luke is the author of the book of Acts also. Many people think the two were hooked together. So he says in the first, first book, it talks about Jesus and what he taught and what he went about doing in the book of Luke. 
But then he starts this second book by saying, this is what he's going to, that's what he did before, and he's implying that this is what he's going to do now. And the book of Acts really is the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit through his chosen vessels to build the church, to extend it. Jesus said what? I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We also pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so the kingdom of God came, the king arrived, and he's expanding his kingdom. And the book of Acts is going to show you how he's going to do that. Now the book of Acts has, um, talks about the wonderful things that the Holy Spirit did through these vessels and, and there were many glorious things that gave us reason to celebrate. In fact, many of us are quick to say, oh, what well, the modern day church, you know, if it could only be like the act book of, but the church in the book of Acts, boy, it would really be, you know, we fail to realize that the book of Acts, the church in the book of Acts, they had their problems and struggles too. So in addition to having a mighty move, and we know that in the book of Acts, after the Holy Spirit came, they started fulfilling what Jesus told them they would do. What was it? You will be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem, where? In Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The book of Acts ends abruptly at chapter 28. It's abruptly. I, I remember the first time I read it, I said, what, what, what happened? Well, I think it's on purpose because we are a part of the 29th chapter of the book of Acts. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is using vessels just like he did there, and he's moving his kingdom, and he's accomplishing his purpose. Amen? Amen. Amen. So taking a look now, let's go to chapter 6. We're going to see a couple of things tonight of things that came against the church there and 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 then what were the solutions and that was the was the outcome of these things and i think this is good because we as people individually and we as a body here have things come against us and so maybe we can learn something from what happened in the book of acts and i might add even before this those of you who haven't read the book of acts know they had some problems, and God took care of them pretty seriously. He talks about kicking the Hickamashai. How many know what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? Yeah. They promised that they were going to give so much money into the church, and they lied. They didn't lie against the church. They lied against the Holy Spirit, and bam, bam, they were struck down. They were struck down. So this was not all a bed of roses, okay? So let's take a look at chapter 6 and see what we can learn from chapter 6. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there's that revival, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. In those days, my friends, they had the big glorious temple, but they also had small synagogues, small gathering places for different people. And you know, just like today, you'll have a certain group will gather together at their church, and oh, they'll accept others, but if you went there, you'd feel like a minority. And that's exactly what it was like here. They had a synagogue that was pr predominantly, they spoke Greek. They spoke Greek, they were Greek-speaking people. And the majority of them that lived in around Jerusalem, they spoke Aramean. And so there was a little discrepancy here. And it says they had a complaint. Why? Because this church, this little synagogue of Greek-speaking Jews felt that their widows were not being taken care of. And it says according to the distribution. Well, we don't even know what they're talking about in chapter 6. So let's go back to chapter 4. Turn back to four. Sure hope you bring your Bibles on Thursday nights. <clears throat> Every night. Chapter four. And let's see. Let's pick it up. Oh, about 34. Let's see what they're talking about, this distribution. Now, what, nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that they were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed them to each, to each as anyone 
had need. And so what they did was, everybody pooled their resources. Whoa, I don't know if we'd do that today. But just think about it. Hey, I just, I just got a, a check in the mail. Okay, throw that in the pot. And then they took the money and they passed it out where it was needed. And it just so happened, going back to chapter 6, these Greek-speaking Jews in their synagogue felt that their widows were not getting their fair share. Okay? So let's see how, the, how they responded. Then the twelve, referring to the twelve disciples, and by the way, Matthias was elected to take Judas' I mean, to take Judas's place. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, Listen to what they said. It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Well, with that response, you can almost guess what they were saying. I mean, these, these critics in this, in this particular synagogue were probably saying, yeah, you're out there preaching and you're out there doing um, preaching and talking to all these people while your own people aren't being satisfied and filled. In other words, you need to be like Jesus and you need to take care of your own. I'm sure that's the type of criticism because right away their response is, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So now they've got two problems. They're complaining because their widows aren't being fed. And now they're saying, oh, what do we tell these guys? Because certainly we're not going to stop preaching. Certainly we're not going to take our, our time away from our prayer time, our preaching time to put everything down and go provide for these widows. So, they solve the problem. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. They're going to be like RAs. I don't know what else to say. These are the first deacons. Is it interesting that the, the people they're looking for? First of all, you got to have a good reputation. If you had a rotten reputation, you're going to go in there. That is not going to work. Re good reputation, and then spirit filled, so that you're lining your prayer life is right. So you're going to serve in the spirit of love, and wise wisdom, knowing when to, when to do what you need to do. You know, people who don't have wisdom and don't feel they're led by the Spirit, they're put in a position where they feel they got to defend themselves. And then they start telling people what they do. And they don't rule with the authority that was given them. They rule with power because they're insecure. So isn't that beautiful how the qualifications are? Is they have to be, they have to be good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Verse 4. But we, the twelve, will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Let me tell you something. The poor you'll always have with you. We need to take care of the poor, but never at the expense of the teaching and preaching of the word of God. I saw that happen. Pastor Walt and I saw, saw that happen in our beloved Salvation Army. Walt and I used to go down there, and we, would, we, we, we preached the old bean line, didn't we? That was down there in the old facility. That's before they had their fancy place. And boy, they had the word of God, and we had altar calls, and he played the piano, and I tried singing, and, and we had a wonderful time. And then when they were fed afterwards, they shifted gears. They moved down the street. We come down there, and they let us know what we could preach and what we couldn't preach, and it definitely wasn't what we'd been preaching. But yet they were good people. They feed and they collect clothing and they do wonderful things for people. But the church of Jesus Christ has got to stick to the word of God. This is the truth right here. We live in a crazy society where everybody picks and chooses what they want. Everything's based on feelings. I feel close to God. I feel close to God. And yet they're not listening to the word of God. So I don't want to go off on a tangent on that one, but I had to put it in there. But this is something that they believed that was important. So let's make a transition here. <clears throat> and listen to the outcome of what they did. Verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip. And then they list all these Greek names. Aren't they smart? They picked Greek Jews 
to be the majority of these deacons so they could relate to these people who were complaining. I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> thought to thought myself. And look at verse 6. Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, the apostles laid their hands on them, and they became the deacons, and they went and served the people. Verse 7. Look at the outcome. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So what happened? They solved the problem. And they went on preaching. And we know when the word goes forth, it's going to accomplish for what it was sent. Amen. And they had people saved. And they said, even some priests. Why did they say that? It's because the priests were a part of the... Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin or Hedron that were opposed to Jesus Christ. And so now they're getting revival that even some of those that were so holding tight to their traditions were willing to hear and open their hearts to the gospel. So not only did this solution provide it to spread, but they had some miracle conversions. And it was a phenomenal thing. So when we have problems, you know, let's not get rocked with the problems. Seek God. He'll give us the answer. And if it's his answer, we're going to see fruit from that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't, don't criticize the person with the problems or knock down our body because we got a problem. You know, let's go for it and seek the answer to it. And we'll have success like they did. Verse 8. Now we're going to shift to another situation. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Verse 9. Then there arose, here comes another group of people, another synagogue. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen. These are Jews that were freed in northern Africa. I did a little research on it. That's all I can tell you. But there again, we're a separate group of people. All right? And then it says this. They disputed with Stephen. Key verse. Verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. I'm going to say it again. These people, they were not able to resist the spirit, the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Turn in your Bibles now to Luke chapter 21, verse 15. The word went out and these people could not resist it. All right? 21. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. 21, verse 15. Look what Jesus tells his disciples. Are you there? Okay. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Okay? This is what Jesus said is going to come down. Look, there it is with Stephen. But, you know, then I read the next verse. You will be betrayed even by your parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Now, it's not going to be his brothers and sisters putting to death, but we know what happens to Stephen. And so the word goes forth. Let me tell you something, my friends. When the word goes forth, listen carefully, with the Holy Spirit's power and wisdom, there are some people where it goes, yeah, just like, yeah, how much time we have left? I want to get out of here. Yeah, it's like this. It just goes like this. Those are the ones you've got to be caring, care, concerned about. But when it goes forth and there's a reaction, I mean, they're not, they're not going to, they're, they can't resist it. They're not necessarily going to respond to it positively, but their heart is it hit. Or they wouldn't react. Okay? You have come across people like that. You know, if they keep on resisting, then their heart hardens, and then they're just like the rest. Talk to my hand. I don't care about you. But let me tell you something. If you've got people that you're talking to, and they are resisting you, to me, that's a healthy sign. 
That means that there's something penetrating. Pray that the, the Lord would just open up their understanding to the truth. But these people back in, in, in Acts 6, they did not want to go along. They were going to continue to resist what the Holy Spirit was doing. So let's go back to chapter 6 and let's see what happens to them. What did they do? Did they say, oh, we can't resist. We, what you're saying is true. We want to join you. No, no, no. These are Jews. They're going to stay Jews. They want to hold true to their tradition. They want to hold true to the worth of their temple. And they want to hold true to their sacrifices. And they don't want to hear about this Jesus and, and the cross and resurrection. Verse 11. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the peep in the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him into the council. Same group that killed Jesus, that, that sentenced Jesus, this, the, the Sanhedrin. They also set up false witnesses, that sounds familiar, who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place, this temple, and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will what? Destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. To us. You know, um, we all know that they have misunderstood what Jesus was saying. We know that Jesus said what? You destroy this temple. Well, who's talking about? His body. You destroy this body and we'll raise it up. But you know, when you look back, listen to this carefully. There's a little more to this destroying this temple, this, this body, but he, I think the temple. What happened when he said, it is finished on the cross? The curtain that separated the most holy place from the holy place was torn in two. Which meant, who needs a temp? Who needs a curtain to separate people from God? Who needs the altar? Who needs the burnt sacrifices? Who needs any of these rituals? Who even needs the temple? It's over with. It's done. And I think this is what these Jews were hearing and they didn't want to hear it. You know, it's kind of like you have everything in the Old Testament, everything from the the veil separating and showing you how holy God is. And we are separated from God. There has to be a sacrifice. We have to transfer our, hand, our sins to an animal that's killed and the blood applied so that we can, I mean, on and on. That's just types and shadows. There's shadows, there's shadows. And then when the light comes, it covers the shadows. We don't need the shadow anymore. We got the light. We've got the light. We have now, we've got a living temple. We are all living stones. We have the temple of God where he's in us. Amen. The whole transmission, I'm sure Stephen was well aware of the gospel. But you know what, my friends? Some people want the shadows because they don't want to change. And they would rather hold on to the shadow. In today's, we're at Paul's words, they have a form of religion, but what? Deny what? The power therein. Oh, don't tell me. I have friends, and if they're watching, this will be interesting. I have college friends that happen to be Norwegians, and they're Lutherans. And they've got Lutheranism monogrammed on their underwear. I'm telling you. <laughs> and you know, they're not quite sure how to deal with with Weber, that was my nickname, my maiden name. I don't know about Webb, she's kind of weird. And I, you know, I'd share some of the things that we were doing, what's happening, and, and out of their mouths, I heard, well, I don't know about that, Webb, you know, I'm Norwegian and we're Lutherans and this is the way we do things and this is what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. They don't want to, they don't want to, they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to deal with the change. They don't want to deal with the change. Somebody once said, because the reality has come, the shadow is gone, 
You are only threatened where you don't want the reality. And the reality is the Holy Spirit's here. The reality is he changes lives. The reality is that we have a living body of Christ and not just rituals. Rituals. And these people wanted to hold on to their rituals. They That temple, I mean, after all, how many years did it take to build it? Look at how beautiful it is and all this good stuff. So you can see how this really rattled their cage. So let's see what happens. And yet all who sat, verse 15, and all who sat in the council looked steadfastly at him, and they saw his face as the face of an angel. So here's this Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking forth the truth. And you know what? They can't, they can't throw stones. It's like, it's like, he's like Jesus. Chapter 7 talks about the long dissertation. And this is one testimony, longest one in the whole Bible, that's included. And that, of course, is Stephen before the Sanhedrin. And he's going to defend. He says, no, 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 no. And he takes the whole history of God's people from Abraham all the way through through Moses, and he honors Moses. But he says, you know, he said, you guys, we did not follow through. We didn't obey Moses. You know what happened when he was on that mountain? You built a golden calf with your own hands. You were rebellious, and you didn't obey the laws that he gave. And then he goes down and he talks about David and Solomon building the temple. Okay? And he's building up. He, they built the temple. But now he goes in. Listen to what he does right before he comes in. You know, let me tell you something. You're going to win an argument. You start on common ground. Common ground. Paul did that when he spoke before the different um, uh, kings and so forth before he went on his way to Rome. Everyone, common ground. So people are going to have their ears open. Yep. Common ground was, yeah, I, we got our history of the Jews. It's all great, you know. But now he's got their attention. And then he says, and you know, Solomon wanted to build God a temple. David did, and Solomon got to do it. But then look what he says in verse 48. He's preparing for the kill. Look what he says in verse 48. However, the Most High, meaning God, does not dwell in temples made with hands. The same phraseology he used when he talked about the golden calf made with their hands. Oh, pride, this is what we made. Uh, now he's starting to touch uh, a nerve. And then he quotes, we know what the prophet said, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. This is God speaking. What house will you build for me, said the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? And then he looks at those guys and look what he says. He just gives them both six shooters, 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets, prophets did, <clears throat> did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to their hearts and they gnashed at their teeth, at him with their teeth. Arr! But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Jesus usually normally was sitting at the right hand. He was standing. I'm his defense attorney and I support this guy is basically what he's saying. And then he says this. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran, man, nothing like being convicted, at him with one accord, all together in unity. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul. And they stoned Stephen as they were calling, as he was calling out to God, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit like Jesus, 
Then he knelt down and he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, just went into the arms of the Lord. Now Saul was consenting to his death at that time a great, and as a result of this, at that time a great persecution arose against the church. That persecution came from these Jews that didn't believe Jesus. And, he, and they're going to be the thorn in Paul's flesh all along. And look what happens. A great persecution arose against the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout. Where did they go? To Judea and Samaria. Hmm. Except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial. They made great lamentation over him. And verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And verse 4, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere. What did they do? They preached the word. You will be my witnesses where? First in where? Jerusalem. Then? And Samaria. So out of what the enemy meant for evil, God used it for good. Because it's just like a billiard ball. Bam! And they scattered. And they went into those regions to preach the word. Amen. And of course, now we're going to learn about the dynamic past of Apostle Paul that's going to rise up. So we have confrontations. We got problems. Man, we're going to... My husband, I get a kick out of him. All hell can break loose. And it's just a minute. He's, I like this. I love this. I, I'm going... I love this. I love this. I wonder how God's going to work this out. Isn't that exciting? That's your shepherd. And that's what we're going to do. Amen? Father, we thank you so much, God. Opposition, persecution. Lord, for me to live is Christ. And to die is what congregation? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. May it be sealed to our hearts. May we have a new boldness. May we be like Stephen, O oh God, the word in our heart, on fire through the Holy Spirit, and walk in holiness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're excused.